Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. Um, thank you for those who've joined us. We decided to have this webinar just a few days ago in response to what uh, the news is reporting as the recent escalations between Israelis and Palestinians. And we feel like there's a bit more to the story that has um, not been heard and certainly is not being reported in US media. So for us, um, one of the realities of what's happening or what we hear um, almost every morning, if you wake up and check the news, the first thing you hear is thousands of rockets have been fired into Israel. And you know, we just were speaking with one of the panelists who mentioned they're in Israel and they have their window open to hear about uh, when the sirens are going off. And so there are certain realities um, that uh, we want to hear about in that regard. But we feel like there's so much more to the story. And also so much depends on where you begin in the timeline of the narrative. And so we're so grateful to each of our speakers. Churches for Middle East Peace has been around for almost 40 years. Uh, we began in large part so churches in the United States could um, join efforts to respond to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And one of our primary priorities is to be in solidarity with the church in the Holy Land. And so many of you know that the church in the Holy Land in large part is centered in the sacred city of Bethlehem uh, and certainly Jerusalem uh, and cities throughout the West Bank and Palestine and the Palestinian Christian church uh, has experienced great challenges. But we wanna talk today about the realities of what's happening. And um, for many who followed the story a little more deeply, the story is not beginning with rocket fire going into Israel. Um, the story begins in a little uh, East Jerusalem neighborhood of Shek Jarrah. And so uh, that's where we'll begin today. And then we wanna talk about the devastating impact, which has had such a disproportionate effect upon the people of Gaza. In the last week alone, more than 60 children have been killed uh, with more than 200 deaths and 50,000 people in Gaza uh, have already been displaced because of Israeli bombing of Gaza. So those are just some of the snapshots of what we'll discuss. I'll very briefly give the names and titles of each of our three guests. We're so grateful in the midst of everything they're going through that they're taking the time to talk with us this morning. You'll have the opportunity to add questions in the chat. But the most important thing is that we want to have the opportunity to hear from them. So we'll begin first with Rula Salame, who's the Education and Outreach Director at uh, Just Vision in Palestine. And we're so grateful to Just Vision, Rula. I had the opportunity to write an article about what's happening in Shakshara. And we've been talking about that incredible film you did called My Neighborhood that tells the neighborhood, the story of Shakshara from years and years ago. And so we'll start with Rula to talk a bit about that reality. We will then move to Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, who has been um, a friend of Churches for Middle East Peace for many, many years. Mitri leads a church in Bethlehem. Uh, he also leads uh, Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture, which has students in Gaza, students who were um, detained as a part of the Shakshara protests, uh, students who've been devastated in Gaza. And so we went to hear from Reverend Dr. Mitri about his perspective and realities. And then we will go to Suha Salman Musa, who's the executive director of the uh, Musawa Center, which focuses on realities affecting Palestinian citizens of Israel, 20% uh, of Israel uh, or Palestinian. And so we want to talk about some of the protests within Israel and what that reality looks like. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, we're grateful for uh, you being here. Rula, may we start with you? If you wanted to just explain simply to people who only hear the news of rocket fire, where do we start? What's the bigger picture of the context of what's happening right now? Hi, good morning, good, uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, and um, I'm, I'm really happy uh, to be part of this panel because also, as you just mentioned, it's really important to tell the story from the beginning. The story starts from, uh, um, it's not Gaza or the rockets, it starts from uh, East Jerusalem, it starts from Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. And if we uh, just give a, a brief about Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, we are talking about 28 Palestinian families who 
who have been uh, um, displaced from 48, since 48, uh, uh, immediately after the 48 war, they have been uh, uh, moved from their original villages and cities inside uh, uh, Israel, and they moved to Jerusalem. And because uh, they are uh, refugees, uh, there's like a, kind of like a deal between the Jordanian government who used to rule uh, um, um, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem before uh, 67, and the UNRWA, and they decide to build this 28 Palestinian um, apartments or houses, small houses. Uh, the Jordanian government provide the, the land. The UNRWA uh, provided the, the buildings. They built the, the 28 buildings. And they choose only 28 Palestinian families. And they were thinking that they will start also, they will start with the 28 families, and then they will continue. And um, in order to give them the apartments, they have to pay rent for uh, three years. Uh, like a monthly rent for three years. And after the three years, they will receive the contract, uh, the agreement that the, these 28 houses will be their own houses. What happened that the 67 uh, uh, war starts and then the Jordanian left and then Israel uh, um, occupied East Jerusalem and then they did not get the original agreements uh, from the Jordanians. And starting from the 72, um, the Israelis claim, especially the settlements, uh, the settlers, uh, settlers companies claim that they owned uh, this piece of land in Sheikh Jarrah that the, the owner built uh, the 28 houses. And they start running after them in the court, the Israeli courts that they need the land and they need to uh, take uh, the houses. And just to make the story short, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, issues in the court uh, since the 72, and they have been uh, asked to provide documents uh, that they, uh, uh, they own the, the lands. Of course, they do not have the original documents. Uh, it's still in the, in the Jordan with the Jordanian. And then they show the court, the owners of the 28 uh, uh, houses, they show all the documents they have, that they have been uh, uh, paying the rent and they have been, like they have a lot of documents to show that uh, they are originally stayed in these uh, uh, homes uh, since uh, 56. And uh, of course the court uh, sometimes will take the documents that this is okay, original documents, but it's not enough, we need more documents. The families, they have a committee in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood and they start uh, uh, um, uh, going to Turkey to ask for documents, uh, to Jordan to ask for more documents. And uh, lately, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, um, the, uh, eviction, uh, the eviction of the families starts and now we have four families out from the neighborhood. So we are talking about 20, uh, 24 uh, uh, families who are still there. Of course, uh, more than 17 families, they have cases in the court. And um, this is the whole story that starts um, in, during Ramadan. They have um, received eviction orders that they have to move uh, um, the first day of, uh, of May. And then people want to go there and support them. And then, of course, uh, we heard the stories of um, how things moved from the Sheikh Jarrah, where is the uh, solidarity movement, uh, people coming from different uh, neighborhood in East Jerusalem. And for those who have permits, they came from uh, some parts from the West Bank, others from the 48 who came and uh, want to show solidarity with the, with the neighborhood. They were staying there. And then, of course, uh, what happened that Israel, they have this, uh, the Israel Authority, they have this checkpoint at the entrance of the neighborhood, the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, they prevent uh, Palestinians, uh, activists, um, activists to enter to the neighborhood. Uh, even sometimes we have international delegations or members from the European Parliament. Uh, of course, this checkpoint is there until now. And there's a lot of violence. I can say that I was there a few times, and you can see the soldiers, the police, they are using violence, they are using, uh, they are shooting uh, rubber bullets, which is originally, it's not rubber bullets, it's really metal uh, covered with, uh, with rubber, and also tear gas, and every night there's like really shootings, and there's people who have been injured, and just yesterday, last night, there's a, um, 
a child who had been in his house, inside the house of the Sheikh Jarrah, on the other part of the Sheikh Jarrah, who just uh, was shot uh, while he was sitting inside his house. And this is why, because they are using, uh, they are shooting and they are using uh, different kinds of weapons against uh, the civilians there. And what happened that Palestinians who used, you know, during Ramadan, the last few days of Ramadan, Palestinian, the Muslims used to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque, pray there and stay overnight. The Israelis, uh, the Israeli uh, police and the soldiers attacked them while they were there inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. You can see hundreds of uh, soldiers uh, and police, Israeli policemen entered the Al-Aqsa, attacked uh, the Palestinians. There was like a lot of shootings, many Palestinians, more than uh, 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 around uh, 400, more than 390 Palestinians were injured at that day. And uh, this is why uh, the, uh, what happened in Gaza starts. I mean, people always uh, leave this story and they start from like, okay, Hamas sent rockets to Gaza. This is not the whole story. We need to, he to hear the whole story from the beginning and then see why. I mean, we can, people from the West Bank, people uh, uh, from uh, Palestinians inside Israel, the 48, Palestinians from uh, in Gaza, uh, they want uh, really to uh, show their support. They want to support the Palestinians in East Jerusalem after everything happened. They start, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, showing their solidarity in different ways. So yes. this is the whole story. Yes. And I think if you just go to justvision.org and uh, get uh, the link or the trailer of My Neighborhood, which is the film about Al-Kurd family, Muhammad Al-Kurd, and how the uh, settlers took part of uh, the house of Al-Kurd family. And of course, there's other stories, but I mean, we covered uh, this uh, part of the story in uh, this Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in our film uh, movie, My Neighborhood. My Neighborhood. And yeah. we've been pointing people to that film. We'll put a link in the chat for people watching to be able to see that. What's amazing is that the young man who's featured in My Neighborhood, Mohammed Al-Kurd, uh, is now a young, uh, international solidarity activist who was detained. There's videos um, on him online that tell a bit of the story of Shakshara. And when this recent escalation uh, de-escalates, the realities of displacement in Shakshara will still be going on, will still be you know, a pending decision. And so we want to keep that context in mind. Um, we did just have an additional panelist join us, uh, Basam Nasser, and you mentioned this Rula, you know, we have to talk about what's happening in Gaza in the context of the bigger realities of the ongoing occupation of the Palestinian people. And we wanted to hear from Basam. He is the director, um, the head of Catholic Relief Services in Gaza. I don't see his video, but I hear he's online and we might have a little yeah. bit of an internet connection, but Bassem, thank you for joining us. We want to hear from you. What's happening? Good evening and good morning for uh, for you in the States. And uh, thank you, Rula, for the, the, the brief introduction. It really saved a lot for me. And I can go directly to what is happening in Gaza. I do represent Catholic Relief Services we are one of the international aid organizations working in Gaza. And uh, until last week, we were preparing for uh, another response for COVID, but unfortunately now we have to deal with the consequences with the current uh, Israeli aggression in Gaza. And uh, so for those who don't know about Gaza, it's a, a coastal strip of less than 300 square uh, kilometers with uh, plus 2 million people living here. Uh, Gaza was struggling anyway, economically uh, with the situation before the current aggression with the consequences of uh, COVID-19 and even before with the major consequences of the Israeli uh, siege in Gaza. So I can start by saying that uh, the answer is clear to your question, Dr. May. The, the issue is the occupation, and the issue will be the occupation today, tomorrow, and in the coming future. And as long as we have an occupation that controls the life of Palestinians and determine to them, uh, when to breathe, what to eat, and uh, and where to go, and when to go, there will be no uh, other uh, way out. But I can tell you that 
with the numbers of Gaza uh, and with the current aggression are going to be even more devastating than the, the, the aggression in 2014. We are still on the 10th day uh, of this, but I can tell you that I hardly uh, received two or three hours a day of sleeping or resting, but still, wow, I am super lucky. I am the most lucky because I'm still alive. And uh, to think that uh, it's a surgical operation or they are targeting uh, certain people, I am living through that. There were two families of doctors. One of them is a doctor of my daughter who were removed from the, what we call the civil registry. They, the, the whole family is gone. The father, the mother, and all the children. Families are being killed while they are sitting for, to have lunch or dinner. Families are being killed while they were trying to sleep in between the, the cycles of, uh, of airstrikes. Airstrikes that we have never witnessed. We consider ourselves as experts of, of going through this, but no, we are not. You think that the trauma that the kids have lived through in 2014 is gone? I tell you, no. It starts from the points that it ended. The screaming, the, the crying, and still we are super lucky because we are still alive. We are, I'm super lucky because uh, uh, some of my colleagues, ha colleagues have minor damages to their home. Only one colleague out of 30 people has the severe damage uh, to his home. No warning as you hear, no prior shootings, Yes, it happened somewhere else. But you know what? I can tell you that for Palestinian families, all what, dream, what we dream about as a Palestinian family, that was the family of my grandfather. And that was the, the, the dream of my father. And this is what I carry for my children, is to raise education, raise children, give them good education, and build a home. And they target the three things. They go after the three things. They go after our children, and then they go after our homes. Homes that are destroyed in Gaza are the work of three generations, 60 years of work. In a blank of a second, it's gone, and the family is homeless. The family has to go sit in an UNRWA school and wait for CRS or other organizations to, to give them aid. So what we are preparing ourselves to do now as a Catholic Relief Services, we are heading toward electronic voucher. This is the most appropriate way of intervention. It maintains the dignity of the people and it also enables them to buy what they need and not us to determine for them uh, uh, if they are receiving blankets or, uh, or mattresses. They, they get a voucher with 50% uh, uh, voucher and 50% cash. They can cash the money from the local supermarket and then decide uh, to do with the cash what they need to do. Uh, currently, we are speaking about targeting only 1,000 families. UNRWA is serving 35,000 uh, people. So with 1,000 family, maybe we are speaking about an average of five to 6,000 uh, individuals. Uh, this is the first uh, way of intervention. The second, we are also assessing the situation of shelters. Since 2014, we were able to help by, uh, some families who had their homes totally destroyed by building for them a timber shelter. Uh, and we are also assisting uh, uh, healthcare facilities uh, some of these facilities you visited yourself, Dr. May, in your last visit to Gaza. Uh, so we were, we were preparing to help them to prepare for COVID. And we have been doing that since, uh, since April. Now that same help is going to be to prepare them to, to deal with the hundreds of uh, casualties that they are receiving. We are speaking about 1,400 people with uh, different types of injuries. We are speaking about 35,000 people at UNRWA schools. Uh, we are speaking about almost the same number who, are, who cannot go to schools. Uh, we can tell you that 
what we call IDPs, internally displaced uh, uh, people. These are the ones that, these are the families that we at CRS target first, because the majority of them do not even know where to go. And uh, those who left the building, the residential buildings, uh, they, they, they don't take anything, but whatever they, they wear on uh, the, the clothes they have on their bodies. I have a friend, he received a, a warning uh, that the building where he lives is gonna be bombed. And the warning said that because we are afraid that you will be harmed because we are gonna target the next building. His daughter has to sit for the Tawjihi exam in mid uh, June. He said, I asked him specifically because I have a daughter, same age and same situation. I said, were you able to carry on any of her books or notebooks? And he said, we, we packed everything and we forget to carry the bag. So they have to go and search through the rubbles. But again, as I started, they do believe themselves, they do consider themselves as super lucky that they are alive every night. People go to sleep around 5 or 6 a.m. It's not that they are tired. They are happy that they are still alive. This is how it came, uh, the, the conclusion that, that Gaza came to. We are really hoping that the end of this cycle is going to be different. It's not going to be repeating what we have been through before. It's going to be mainly removing the occupation take the occupation out of our lives. This is the very simple demands of Palestinians. Whether this is in Sheikh Jarrah, or in, uh, at Al-Aqsa Mosque, or in Gaza, or in, in, in the different villages and cities in the West Bank, we are tired of this. And I think that the message to the outside world is enough is enough. You know, we are simply human like, like everybody else take the occupation out of our lives. They, they claim that they were out of Gaza. They are not out of Gaza. They control everything in Gaza. They control every aspect of life in Gaza. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm very sorry for the long... Uh, no, no. Shukran, Katir. And I have to say, and I want everyone watching and people who watch this later to hear, Bassam is such an incredible leader and the work of Catholic Relief Services is so amazing. They were previously the largest recipient of a US aid funded grant for $50 million uh, over five years, if I recall the details right, that was completely cut off because of the Trump administration. They just received some US funding for COVID response and now the responses that will be needed in Gaza are um, so much more severe because of displacement, because of dismemberment, because of injury, because of death. And so we're so grateful, Bassam, for you being here with us. I hope you'll be able to stay uh, for some of the questions um, as we continue the conversation. We'll move to Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb, um, who's been a global leader for the Palestinian church, who has been an advocate. Mitri, uh, uh, tell us what we need to know. I've heard you say we have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we're addressing this conflict. Um, may we hear from you, your perspective. Yeah, thank you, May. Uh, and uh, thank you, Rola and uh, Bassam. It's, uh, you know, to hear from Gaza always, uh, I mean, uh, it uh, break my heart uh, um, because uh, if uh, Bassam is fortunate, we are here maybe more fortunate uh, I think the question Rola started where to start. Um, I can start with Balfour, but I will not do it today. We can start with the Nakba that is ongoing. I will not do it today. We can start with uh, 67 when I was five years old and the Israeli occupation started, but I will not start there. I will start with the Trump administration because I want to connect what's happening here with the US, because I think uh, this is really important for the work of CMAP. You know, when Trump uh, uh, decided to move the embassy and recognize Jerusalem uh, as the capital of Israel, uh, he gave boost to the settler colonial movement in Israel. 
because they understood this as a green light to continue their uh, colonialism in East Jerusalem. And this is really what, this is the background of uh, what happened in Sheikh Jarrah. And then we had the Gulf states uh, making the so-called Abraham uh, Accord with Israel, again, through the Trump administration, which really gave the Palestinians the feeling that they are being sidelined. Um, and everyone was telling us, you know, your issue is not important anymore in the region. Uh, so give up and surrender. Uh, and then uh, there were uh, the Palestinian elections uh, where many young people were eager, you know, to have a voice and to have a say. They were not happy about what was happening here uh, by the occupation, by the authority, by Hamas, by everything. And so they were eager to cast their vote and then the elections were postponed, which really made them again uh, angry. And then we had two human rights reports coming out, one from Beth Salem, a Jewish human rights organization, and the other uh, from Human Rights Watch, basically saying what we always knew, but uh, nobody believed us, that the situation here cannot be described but as apartheid. And most important thing, apartheid on both sides in line. Apartheid is the reality in the whole of historic Palestine. Basically, this gave also our people a boost that, you know, maybe now people will walk up and will understand what's happening. All of this happened while we were following the case in the court of George Floyd, because George Floyd's story is the story of every Palestinian young man in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, I mean, our young people being humiliated left and right. Uh, and they saw what happened there in the US. And they felt that Israel has impunity. And again, this made them even more and more uh, angry. And then came, you know, during the fasting month of Ramadan, when, uh, you know, people would like always to go to Jerusalem to play at, uh, to pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the third uh, most holiest place in Islam. Uh, and then they were stopped. They were not allowed to get in. They were shot at, which really, you know, uh, violated their religious feeling. And religious feelings in Jerusalem is something that, you know, always is explosive. And I know that from our own students. I have students. I posted that on Facebook. You know, uh, uh, you know, many of them are not religious, but during this holy month of Ramadan, they want to pray there. And if they feel that the most holy place is being attacked, you know, they want to be there in the forefront. They want to defend uh, that uh, holy uh, shrine. And so all of this actually led to, uh, to what happened in Gaza. So this is the... The, 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 pre, the preview of what we see. Uh, the problem is, and I agree there with uh, Bassam, uh, uh, you know, we need to look at the root causes uh, so that this will not be repeated. I'm afraid it will be repeated because the international community, they just react when there is an escalation of violence. They want us to be calm. Once we are calm, nobody does anything. We go back to, you know, Israel feels, you know, they don't need to do anything because everything is calm. Uh, and so I'm afraid we are going to the same cycle again, unless we deal with the root causes. And this is why I said, we need a paradigm shift now. And the paradigm shift says, what we have here in historic Palestine is not a conflict. It's not a conflict between Israeli and Palestinian over a piece of land, like even I used to say a few years ago. Actually, it's a settler colonial project. What Israel is doing here is what, you know, uh, the European immigrants did to the Native American. It's what, 
you know, the Boers did to the uh, Blacks in South Africa. It's what the British did to the Aboriginal in, in Australia. This is the story because, you know, you have a settler colonial movement that wants the whole land without the people. Uh, and so they keep pushing us out, out, out. Uh, ultimately, they want to eliminate, uh, eliminate us. And this is why I think we need more and more to speak of this paradigm shift of the settler colonial project. And let me end with a positive note, actually. What I was witnessing these last few days are two important things. One is that the Palestinians, if in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, inside the Green Line or in the diaspora, they all were speaking in one voice. Uh, they were uh, uh, basically uh, showing their unity. And now that they really understood the settler colonial uh, aspect of this, uh, of this occupation, for me, that is a very positive sign. And the other positive sign is to see all of these, uh, you know, demonstrations in Chicago, in Dearborn, in, in Yemen, in Baghdad, in uh, Sydney, you name it. What I see there is that actually uh, Palestine is the last anti-colonial struggle. And for me, it, it is moving to see that, you know, the international community, the grassroots, are actually uh, showing their solidarity because they know this is not only about Palestine. This is really Palestine is the last anti-colonial uh, struggle. So we need CMAP to, uh, you know, to to advocate uh, for this. I know you are doing this, uh, and uh, we need right now immediate ceasefire to stop the bloodshed. Uh, because we have had enough bloodshed. Uh, tomorrow, with Bright Stars of Bethlehem, I will be speaking more about our work in Gaza. But this is now for now. Thank you, May. Thank you, um, Reverend Mitri. We'll point people also to Bright Stars of Bethlehem uh, and to that event that um, Reverend Mitri just mentioned. Um, our immediate call at Churches for Middle East Peace is to um, call for a ceasefire and an end to the violence. But as we've been discussing and as we began with Rula, the realities of displacement in Shakshara are still going to be an issue once the bombs stop, stop falling on Gaza. Um, you know, the realities of the occupation will still be an issue when the world stops paying attention. Um, and I'd encourage if our panelists are able, we're starting to get some questions that are written. Some of those questions we won't have the opportunity to get to verbally, but if our panelists might be willing to answer them, we'll try to get to them. Um, but we want to hear um, from Suha. Uh, from Musawa, and then also Kyle Christofalo is joining us from Washington, D.C., and we want to just share briefly just what you mentioned, Reverend Mitri, of what is the work that CMEP is doing, because the reality is the U.S. is culpable. The U.S. is providing many of the weapons and arms that are being used in this conflict, uh, and the U.S. government plays a role in not being an honest broker of peace. You know, we're very one-sided in our political engagements. So we want to talk about that for just a minute. But before we do, uh, Suha Salman Musa, the executive director of Musawa uh, in Israel, um, welcome. And please tell us what's happening in Israel and tell us about your organization uh, and the work it does on behalf of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Thank you so much. Um, I'll do it briefly because I know that there's a lot of questions that they, all the panelists they, um, would like to answer. But as a, of our organization, we are the Musawa Center, uh, an advocacy center for Palestinian citizens of, uh, in Israel. Musawa in Arabic means equality. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, the advocacy center to promote the economic, social, cultural, political rights of Palestinians, a minority uh, citizens. Um, we uh, promote democratic society and act against all kind of uh, a, a discrimination. But um, I would like to focus on what we are doing now in this uh, uncertain and uh, this crisis, uh, in time of crisis. Uh, we, the team of Musawa Center, uh, are now focusing on several fronts. Um, 
you know, all of it is now you talked about Gaza, Sheikh Jarrah, uh, and the West Bank, but we are focusing on, uh, on our community here. We established an emergency committee with uh, several political parties and civil, uh, civil society organizations in order to, um, uh, to help our community. And I will do briefly why we do these things because what the attacks on our community and, and our uh, young people have been extremely, uh, we haven't seen this since 2000, uh, October 2000 demonstration. Uh, we also, uh, we are forming a civil defense teams in order to defend, uh, to, to defend the peaceful uh, young people protesters uh, that have been arrested, uh, as well as we are trying to raise awareness of our rights as a protester, as, as, as the citizens in, in, in order to, um, uh, to bring our voice and not to silence us. We also documenting uh, racist attacks and I can share with you, um, you know, uh, during this webinar, a report that we had uh, um, uh, 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 prepared it includes a lot of um, uh, 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 acts and events uh, that happened inside in, in Arab localities and in mixed cities, especially. And I will share it, uh, as, uh, you know, in a moment. Um, we, you know, um, these um, attacks we we have been brutally ar uh, attacked and arrested arrest by uh, uh, the police uh, um, officers. We are working with legal attorneys in order to help and to release. Uh, uh, the people that were arrested. We have more than over 1,000 people that have been arrested, but also we have more than 145 people that have been charged and uh, uh, keeping uh, holding them in the Shabbat, the service, uh, uh, the, the, the security service of, uh, of Israel. And uh, sometimes we cannot speak with them. We are also providing um, um, a needed uh, suppliers to medical teams, especially in the neighborhood, in the mixed cities, uh, like Lod, like Haifa, uh, like Kiafa and Dramli, and also Akka. Uh, and also we are providing uh, some speakers uh, uh, and cons uh, you know, providing consultation to them because we are also have been attacking, attacked and and incited by the media, the Israeli media. And this is something that we are trying to, um, uh, to work on because when the media are inciting against us, the whole uh, community or the other side of the community is inciting against our people, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, through the social media. Um, as well, we are uh, trying to also do an international advocacy, and this is uh, one of uh, the things that we are participating in webinars, but we also call uh, the international uh, community to stop the war in Gaza, to stop the eviction of uh, the people in the Palestinian in Sheikh Jarrah, to stop the brutal attack on uh, our community and uh, on the Palestinian uh, citizens. Um, I would like to say that the current crisis, um, as we all know, uh, was created and in initially by the Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, who, uh, who over the past decade uh, has repeatedly incited not only against uh, you know, uh, Gaza, the Palestinian, the peace process, but also against the country's uh, Arab citizens. For uh, the past uh, five years, he had worked to deepen uh, the occupation, increase the, increase the incitement, and widen the rift of the public sphere. This crisis led for uh, to four elections in less uh, than two years, and we might have this uh, fifth election. And also, the, the legitimizing the, he, he did the legitimizing of the Kahanis. Uh, what we have been seen with uh, uh, Yehuda, Yehudit, with uh, Ibn Gvi, and with Smotrich, uh, this is something that we haven't been seen before. This is a, um, uh, the incitement that they, they have uh, done uh, against um, uh, not only Palestinian uh, people, but also against us, led to uh, these attacks from uh, the settlers and from the extreme right-wing uh, supporters of them to come into our Arab localities, to come to our uh, mixed cities and to attack our homes, to attack our young children, to, uh, to get into the houses and attack the people inside the, the houses. Um, we also uh, documented that this group 
uh, is trying not only to evict uh, Rula from Sheikh Jarrah, they are trying also to, ev to evacuate people from Ramli, from Lod. Uh, um, and this is it's not happening only in the West Bank, this is happening inside our villages and mixed cities. These people are, were marking the houses of Arab uh, residents in mixed cities in order to attack them. Uh, so what the situation here in, in the, on the ground is, is, is something that we haven't, as I said, uh, seen before. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, um, uh, injuries because of uh, the attacks of the police uh, officers, but also because of the attacks of uh, uh, the settlers. Unfortunately, we have already two people that were killed. Uh, the, uh, the young people that was announced a half an hour ago, he's from Umm al-Fahim. Uh, he was shot by a police officer and they, was announced, uh, uh, they announced his, uh, his death uh, like half an hour ago. And this is something I'm, I'm afraid, you know, I, I don't know how uh, Umm al-Fahim, and you heard all the news uh, with Umm al-Fahim, uh, uh, um, how the people are trying to uh, demonstrate and protest against all, all the, the, the incitements uh, against us. Um, uh, I would like also to mention that uh, the High Follow-Up Committee declared a strike uh, yesterday, and it was a very successful one, despite the, um, the actions that we heard from employers calling their employees that if you will not attend uh, the, you know, to, 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 go, to come to, the, to your work, you will be fired. Uh, customers were uh, doing lynch and social media uh, about uh, people that were working with them and call it, colleagues of them just because they want to participate in a legitimate, legitimate, uh, a legitimate uh, strike and they wanted to participate in a peaceful demonstration or even if they would like to say something on social media against war, against crime. So this is a situation that really everyone is inciting against us and we are trying our best as a community to work together to protect ourselves. People in mixed cities have shifts in order to protect their neighborhoods from these attackers. Um, um, I would like to also share, as I said, the report for, uh, with you because I know that uh, we have some questions. I will share the reports. Uh, hopefully that you will find a lot of information there. We are trying to provide the international community of what is really happening here and not what the, uh, um, the media is, is trying to provide you with, with the information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suha. And we're grateful for your work. People have been asking, how can they support? How can they send money uh, to support what's happening uh, in Gaza, the families that have been so affected? So we're sending them to each of your organizations. And for those watching, we'd ask you, please support the incredible work um, of each of these organizations that are represented here. And we put links to you know, Catholic Relief Services in Gaza, uh, Mitri to Bright Stars of Bethlehem and Dar al Kalima. Uh, to Just Vision and to Musawa. Um, I want us to go to Washington, D.C. for just a moment. Kyle Christofalo is CMEP's head of uh, our office in D.C. He's our Senior Director of Advocacy and Government Relations. And some of the people are already asking, what can we do? So one of the things you can do is certainly donating and supporting organizations that are responding to these material needs on the ground. Um, but also what you can do is use your voice to help shift perspectives in the US towards more holistic engagement. We are calling for what you have heard from, from others today, first for a ceasefire, but also that the core issues be addressed. And in a few minutes, we'll um, have some a brief time for question and answer. And one of the main questions we're getting is, why is Hamas firing so many rockets into Israel? And so I want us to talk about that in a moment. But before we do, Kyle, how can people engage in terms of political advocacy? Uh, what's CMAP doing in this regard in terms of mobilizing people to constructively engage? Thank you, May, and I'll, I will be very brief because I want to make sure we get to questions. Uh, you know, as uh, May said, uh, we are really pushing uh, in the immediate term for an end uh, to all violence, to a ceasefire. We feel that uh, currently the administration has not been forceful enough. The president uh, just a few days ago did indicate that he expressed support for a ceasefire in conversations 
with the Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel, uh, but that's not sufficient. We need to demand uh, a ceasefire. So we have an action alert out uh, that I will put a link to in uh, the chat, and we would encourage you to uh, take action there, to reach out to your congressional, uh, in this case, uh, actually to the president directly through this form, uh, to say that, uh, that the president needs to demand a ceasefire, and then beyond that needs to confront the other conditions of the occupation that our panelists have uh, indeed already mentioned. Uh, we need to make sure that the US uh, is clear that settlement activity uh, is illegal and that we oppose it, and, and that we work to directly intervene to ensure that the eviction orders in Sheikh Jarrah are halted permanently. Uh, and we know that uh, Sheikh Jarrah is just one of the communities in East Jerusalem and throughout the West Bank that are, are, are confronting these um, uh, eviction orders. So we need uh, significantly more leadership from the US in this regard. So I encourage you to take action there. Uh, if you've taken action already, please uh, share with your friends and families and, and folks within your community. We also have an action alert regarding uh, legislation that gets at some of the broader dynamics of transparency around US funds that have helped um, displace Palestinian families, uh, demolish Palestinian homes, and uh, detain and abuse Palestinian children. So Congresswoman Betty McCollum has legislation out uh, that would uh, really get to more transparency on how US funds to Israel are used. So it, we'd encourage you to take that action as well. And I'll just leave you with, you know, uh, Reverend Mitri talked about his, uh, the positive signs of seeing all of these movements throughout uh, cities across the world uh, standing in solidarity uh, for justice and peace for all in Israel-Palestine. We're seeing that movement on Congress too. There has been a significant shift in members of Congress who are now willing to call out um, the abuses and violations uh, that, that we're seeing against the Palestinian people who are calling into question how U.S. funds are being used, who are calling into question whether the US really can be seen as an as a honest broker in this conflict. And I can tell you, I've been you know, working on this issue in, in DC for you know, seven, eight years. And uh, when I started, you were not seeing even one member of Congress who would publicly say these things. So we're seeing a shift and we need you to really, um, we're seeing that shift because of the grassroots and folks that are calling and pressuring and advocating. So we need you all to continue uh, to do that. And there will be some uh, even new legislation in the coming days trying to, again, shine a light on, on how US funds to Israel are being used and, and pending arms sales uh, to Israel uh, that have just been recently announced. So I'll stop there because I know there are a lot of questions. Thank you, Kyle. So we did get a question from someone who's a Jewish uh, attendee who said, what types of things can they do? And I think solidarity, using your voice is one of the things um, that can be done, certainly on social media, sharing things like this type of video conversation, but advocating with your elected members uh, in Congress and then um, in the State Department and with the administration is one of the most powerful things we can do in the US context. Um, so we've gotten several questions about what is Hamas trying to accomplish? And there's been some comments on that. Um, what are they trying to accomplish by sending rockets into Israel? So Mitri, could we start with you? Um, how, how do you help? You know, that's the first thing we hear in the news, 3,000 rockets over the last two weeks, you know, or something. Uh, I don't know the exact statistic as of today. Um, how can we understand that? And what is Hamas trying to accomplish? Oh, you are muted still. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, I think, many things that we can say here. Uh, first of all, we have to realize that Gaza is the largest open air prison in the world uh, with unemployment rate of over 50%. Uh, all of these young people that maybe are now working with firing rockets, they were born in Gaza while Gaza was under siege. They were never uh, be able, uh, were never able to leave Gaza uh, to see anything else. Uh, and so uh, unemployed, uh, I mean, what do you do? Uh, th that is one thing. And so then it's easy to instrumentalize these young people. Secondly, uh, I mean, definitely uh, politically, uh, this move was important for Hamas because with the election being postponed, through the election, Hamas had uh, 
you know, the ambition to get uh, a foot uh, in the West Bank. Uh, that was then not possible when the uh, election were postponed. And so through uh, this action, they were able to connect Gaza with Jerusalem, which is very, very important for Hamas, not only ideologically, but politically, and that's really important. Uh, and third, uh, I think they, uh, they wanted uh, also to, uh, to show Israel that, uh, you know, in the last seven years, they were able to, to upgrade uh, their facilities. And if, uh, if Israel keeps bombing them, they can also do the same to Israel. So it was a lesson also sent to Israel and, and it's still being done, but maybe Bassam can say more on that. Yes, uh, first I'll, I volunteer to be the Hamas spokesperson, but then I will give my, my own answer. If I'm Hamas spokesperson, I would simply say, living under the occupation, we have every legitimate right to resist the occupation. Every Palestinian says that the rocket is not a popular piece when they speak in the media, therefore they use the rockets. But what about the stones? Why they shoot people who, who are marching peacefully? Why they are shooting people who are standing in Sheikh Jarrah, doing nothing and not allowing them even to stand? They don't allow people to pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque. And now they are speaking about the rockets. If I was Hamas, I would say, as a Palestinian people under the occupation, we have every legitimate right to resist the occupation. Rockets were not before 2003, 2004 why the occupation did not end. So the occupation is continuing to prevent the rocket. The occupation should have ended the next day of, conduct, of, of making that mistake and occupying a, another people. My own analysis of this, I can tell you very simple. What a prisoner, an inmate, to end his imprisonment, what does he or she do? They go into a hunger strike. They harm themselves, they harm their body, or they burn they burn their beds, they burn the prison. All of these are acts that are supposed to be accepted for someone who is under the occupation, who is oppressed for years, for decades. And I can tell you one simple thing. Occupation is older than rocket. Occupation is older than Hamas. Occupation is older than me. Occupation is older than this generation that, that represent more than 60% of Gaza. End the occupation, and I will guarantee that the rockets will end. I can guarantee that Hamas will end also. And regarding what, what people can do, and I'm very keen about it, those who care about the existence of Israel shall stop that extreme fanatic apartheid that controls that state of Israel. They shall stop them. They shall bring them back to the table. They shall bring them back to mature way of thinking. Because the way they, the way they are taking this country, they are taking that into the massive confrontation. They are unifying the Palestinian people of all fronts, of all factions, all together, because you have no choice but to resist the occupation. The occupation is not going to accept you. You know what? The occupation is not accepting the, the collaborators. The collaborators are going to pay the price for being a collaborators of the occupation. And therefore, the occupation, one day, they will get rid of them. Therefore, if this is the way of life, let's live the way Gaza and Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah are living and Lod and, and the other Palestinian cities. I, and the last thing, what are we waiting for people from Washington? I'm waiting for them to be human. I'm waiting for them to be, to be objective. I'm waiting for them to open their eyes and look carefully and look and, and check what is happening. I'm, re I'm really hoping that they can intervene to protect Israel, if not to protect me and not to protect the people of Gaza to come and protect Israel because that's their only chance. Otherwise, it's... It's not going to be. It's not going to be good even for them. 
Thank you, Bassam. One of the things we talk about at CMEP, you know, we've had campaigns, churches against annexation um, and calling for an end to the occupation. And so in just our last few minutes, uh, Rula, what is, you know, when we talk about ending the occupation, what are things people in the US can do to help bring about an end to the occupation? This is a great question. I think what we need to ask them to do is just stop funding Israel. I mean, uh, we are talking and we are hearing and we are listening about different things from the from the U.S. the U.S. U.S. government. I mean, they are supporting uh, Israel with all the weapons, and Israel is using all the weapons against the Palestinians, the civilians in Gaza. I mean, what what the rocket can do if we can compare the rockets with what uh, Israel have with the uh, with the weapons that they are getting from the United States? Uh, it's the problem is 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 not uh, that Hamas is sending rockets. Um, it's the, the problem why Hamas is doing that. Hamas is doing that because they want to support the Palestinians in East Jerusalem. We have been talking about the issues inside Jerusalem and no one is listening to us. We have been talking about not only the eviction of 28 Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah, there's also another hundreds of Palestinian families and tens of Palestinian neighborhoods who are facing, who will be facing uh, soon after uh, Sheikh Jarrah eviction orders. We are talking about uh, about Silwan uh, and the eviction for uh, for uh, um, more than uh, 80 families. We are talking about the uh, Shafat refugee, refugee camp, but also the eviction there. We are talking about more violence inside inside East Jerusalem. I mean, Israel, after building the separation wall, what they are doing to the Palestinians inside East Jerusalem, they are trying really to separate us from our sisters and brothers in the West Bank and uh, from our brothers and sisters in Gaza. We are facing the occupation alone. I mean, uh, uh, Hamas starts sending rockets because the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, especially in Sheikh Jarrah and uh, inside Al-Aqsa Mosque, they are asking for help and support. We did not get any support from the Arab countries. They just left us alone. From the United States, we are not receiving anything. I mean, we don't want the, 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 the money from the United States. We need, which is more important, we need the support. Stop funding Israel. Stop funding the, the uh, Israel with the weapons. Uh, just come and see the situation on the ground. Be with us. I mean, be with us on the ground. And then you can say if, if you want to support Israel anymore. I mean, what about the siege uh, around uh, uh, um, Gaza for, for, for more than 15 years? I mean, I'm really trying to understand the situation here uh, by, by uh, uh, getting the stories from my friends in Gaza. I don't know how they can live there. I don't know how they can raise their kids. What about, uh, and Israel and the international world are talking about the, for, for uh, forgive and for uh, uh, like better situation and peace process what kind of peace process we we will be explaining to the new generation in gaza what about the kids who lost their families and parents and like as Bassam mentioned 12 families were arrested totally the whole family were killed in one night and what why they are civilians the only problem the only issues around them is that they are palestinians from gaza I mean, the towers that we saw in like few seconds, hundreds of apartments and offices, like media offices and people like civilians, they have, as Bassam mentioned, they, they, uh, they have been working for 30, 40 years to, uh, uh, to be able to buy an apartment in Gaza. And now, like in few seconds, they lost everything. I mean, how yes. we can explain to them? Uh, what I'm talking, I mean, I just saw one of the questions, what the, um, the American Jewish can do. We need you to raise your voice. We need you to say, like, stop funding Israel. I mean, the settlement and the settlers, what they are doing in Israel. The settlers have the right, if they are coming from any country in the world, the minute they enter to Israel, they can be Israelis and they can get the passports and they will uh, immediately will be settled in one of the settlements. They are confiscating our land and they are taking our water and electricity and everything. And they are pushing us from Jerusalem and from the West Bank and from Gaza. And they don't want a Palestinian here. They want the land with no one. This is the problem. And I don't know how we can explain it like really very simple 
to the uh, uh, Americans and the Jewish uh, in, in the United States. I've been touring in the United States many, many years and explaining to them, and they were shocked. I mean, what you are talking yes. about? Many, please many stop Americans. Stop funding Israel. Please stop funding. Don't understand please, the I mean, reality. Especially the, the, right. the, the people who are paying the taxes. This money is from the taxes from the Americans. Come and see what the, your money is doing to the Palestinians, to the civilians, to the children in Gaza. I mean, just yes. come and see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rula. Um, I would encourage people, so many people have said, what can we do? Watch the Just Vision video, show it in your small group, show it in your churches. It's a very short video. You can do it in an hour, you can watch it and discuss it, and then talk about what's happening in Shekshara today. That's a great starting point for communities that might not have any idea of many of the realities Rula was just talking about. Uh, Suha, you have the last word in just a minute, and I'm sorry that uh, the time is so tight, but but, you know, many people are saying, how can we support, you know, Palestinian citizens of Israel? How can we call for equality and civil rights? And so what does that look like from your perspective as what, what can people do? People can look at the other side of the story, not only what is mentioning in the media, on the mainstream media in the US especially. Uh, we have a sister organization called Friends of Musawa in the US and uh, the, our goal is to bring our voice as a Palestinian and citizen of the state to the American public and to the officials. And this is part of our work that we are encourage people to really communicate with us, to really you know uh, uh, and uh, look at what is going, going on on the ground. Um, as I said, uh, look to the other side of the story. The, what, what Rula and the Sam were mentioning of all the, these uh, issues uh, that are uh, happening, it's also happening for, with our uh, community from home demolition, from land confiscation, from uh, police brutality. You need to understand we are suffering from the police brutality that the African American were su are suffering. Black Lives Matter is no different uh, than Palestinian Lives Matter. This is the same situation that we are dealing with. We are seeing Citizen, uh, second class citizen, uh, as we all know, but we are still here and you need to uh, reach out to us. As I said, I, I sent a link to a, a report that we had, uh, a, a, you know, um, organized in the last few days. Uh, it, it includes a lot of information. Please go to our website, musawa.org, uh, to the English page, go to the Friends of Musawa, subscribe there. We, we, we have the information that I think and I believe that you need to um, look for in order to understand what's really happening and really um, uh, be in touch with us on the ground here and also uh, communicate with your officials and with your organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Suha. We'll point people to each of your respective organizations. Thank you so much for the work you do. If there is one thing that every person who watches this video might do, fill out the action alert that CMEP has created that goes to President Biden, Vice President uh, Harris, uh, calling for a ceasefire and an end to the core causes of the conflict, uh, including the ongoing occupation of the Palestinian people. Um, thank you, uh, Bassem, uh, especially our hearts are with Gaza. Uh, we pray for you. We want to support you. We're grateful that you're okay, um, but know that to be okay doesn't mean to be safe. And so we want to pray for peace while working for justice. Thank you for all who've joined us. Thank you, especially for our speakers. We'll certainly be in touch.